Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I have gathered three horror stories for you to listen to. I hope you enjoy them. If you love stories like these, please give us a like. And if you want to support the channel, please subscribe. Thank you so much for all the support. Now, on with the stories. In 1984, a small town in Utah found itself shaken by a tragedy that would go unsolved for more than two decades, a mystery that would weigh heavily on the hearts of a family, haunt the memories of local residents, and defy the best efforts of law enforcement. Until one day, a miracle of modern forensics would crack the case wide open. This is the story of Bradley Newell Perry, a young man full of promise, whose life was taken in a brutal crime that few could forget. Bradley Perry was 22 years old, with a bright future on the horizon. A student at Weber State College, he was studying hard, saving money for his education and upcoming wedding. He was engaged to his high school sweetheart, Laura, and in those final weeks of his life, Brad was doing everything he could to prepare for the future they planned together. To save for tuition and wedding expenses, Brad took a night job as a gas station attendant in his small hometown of Perry, Utah. The gas station was locally owned, a familiar spot where Brad could work his shift in relative quiet. Most nights were calm, with occasional customers passing through. Friends and family knew him as a warm and friendly presence at the counter, always willing to help anyone in need. But early on the morning of May 26, 1984, everything changed. Two customers stopped by the gas station in the pre-dawn hours, just looking to fill their tank and pick up some cigarettes. It was supposed to be an ordinary stop, but this visit turned out to be anything but. As they paid for their items, they noticed something strange. The man behind the counter was handling their change, and as he did, they saw that his hands, his shoes, and even the money he handed them were all covered in blood. The two men, understandably shaken, left quickly and drove to the nearest police station to report what they had seen. In their hurried explanation, they described the man they just encountered, noting his appearance, demeanor, and the blood they had seen so plainly on his hands. Police wasted no time. Officers rushed to the gas station, hoping to find the person the witnesses had described. But by the time they arrived, the man was nowhere to be seen. As officers surveyed the station, they made their way to a small back room behind the counter. There, they found Bradley Perry. He had been killed in a violent attack leaving his family and his community in shock and disbelief. As the investigation unfolded, it became clear this was not going to be a simple case to solve. The police were dedicated, combing over every inch of the crime scene for clues. They found fingerprints and a few hairs, pieces of evidence they hoped would eventually lead them to Brad's killer. But in 1984, forensic technology was limited. Fingerprint analysis was in its early stages, and DNA testing as we know it today simply didn't exist. Investigators took statements from anyone they could find who had been near the gas station that night. They even brought in the two men who had initially reported the blood-stained money, asking them to help create a composite sketch of the suspect. One of the men had some skill in drawing, which helped refine the sketch to a remarkable degree of accuracy. The likeness provided a glimmer of hope, but it wasn't enough to pinpoint a suspect. As the investigation wore on, several potential suspects came into focus. One was the gas station's manager, who, on the morning of Brad's death, had shown up late, claiming he had overslept. There were also rumors circulating about the manager's possible involvement in local drug sales, fueling suspicions that maybe Brad had seen something he shouldn't have. But when authorities ran the manager's fingerprints against the ones found at the scene, they came up empty-handed. Police also looked into Wade Maughan, a known drug dealer with a reputation for trouble. Maughan was close to the gas station manager, and his name surfaced several times in connection with the case. But Maughan's hair and fingerprints did not match the evidence left behind, and once again, the investigation hit a dead end. For years, Bradley Perry's murder became one of Perry, Utah's most painful unsolved mysteries. His family, devastated and heartbroken, spent each passing year hoping for answers that never seemed to come. Brad's mother, Claudia, and his fiancée, Laura, struggled with grief and the torment of not knowing who was responsible. For over 20 years, the case went cold. Then, in the early 2000s, advancements in forensic science opened up new possibilities. In 2005, investigators took a second look at the evidence from Brad's case, including hair samples collected from the scene. 
They submitted the hair for DNA testing, which had become far more advanced than it was in the 1980s. This time, the results yielded a match. The DNA led them to Glenn Howard Griffin, a man who was already incarcerated in California for an unrelated crime. Griffin's profile was in the system, and the match was unmistakable. Armed with this new evidence, police tracked down Wade Mon, the man who had once been a prime suspect. Under renewed scrutiny, Mon admitted to his role in the events of that fateful night, detailing how he and Griffin had gone to the gas station and had gotten into an argument with Brad. Mon explained that while he had been there, it was Griffin who had committed the attack. He confessed to helping move Brad's body to the back room, but he testified that Griffin was the one who had ended Brad's life. The police finally had their breakthrough, and in 2008, Glenn Griffin stood trial for the murder of Bradley Perry. The prosecution presented the DNA evidence alongside Mon's testimony, painting a clear picture of Griffin's actions that night. The jury found Griffin guilty of first-degree murder, a conviction that brought long-awaited relief to Brad's family. Instead of the death penalty, the jury sentenced Griffin to life in prison without the possibility of parole. For Brad's family, the conviction offered some solace, though the pain of their loss would never fully heal. His brother Lee spoke for the family when he said the verdict was likely what Brad himself would have wanted, a decision that upheld justice without adding further harm. Today, Bradley Perry's story serves as both a reminder of the resilience of those left behind and a testament to the power of forensic science to provide answers, even in the face of long-standing mysteries. The case may be closed, but the memory of Brad's life and the tragedy of his death remain etched in the hearts of his family, his friends, and his community. In the small, quiet town of Blackfoot, Idaho, the winter of 1987 seemed like any other, blanketed by cold, snow-laden silence and surrounded by sprawling fields. This was farm country, a place where everyone knew everyone, and Lev's moved at a gentle, familiar pace. But in February of that year, something sinister began to creep into this peaceful community, something that would leave scars not just in Blackfoot, but throughout the neighboring towns as well. Stacy Baldwin Larson was 21 years old, a well-loved young woman who worked at a local convenience store called the Red Mini Barn. She was known for her warm smile and kind demeanor, the kind of person who treated customers as friends, always willing to chat or help anyone who came through the door. Like many in Blackfoot, she held down her job with pride, thankful for a steady income and a place in the community. The Red Mini Barn was more than just a store to the residents. It was a familiar landmark, a place where locals gathered for snacks, gas, or last-minute groceries. Late-night shifts at places like these were routine in towns like Blackfoot, but they carried an inherent risk. The stores were often staffed by one person alone and were relatively isolated, especially after dark. But in Blackfoot, few had ever worried about crime. Stacy and the people around her lived in a bubble of comfort, feeling shielded from the harsh realities often seen on the evening news. But on February 27, 1987, that bubble burst. It was a cold, clear evening as Stacy clocked in for her shift. The air was still, the streets empty, as most of the town had settled in for the night. Stacy's shift went as usual, with the occasional customer coming and going. She had no idea that this would be her final shift at the Red Mini Barn. Sometime after 9.45 p.m., a man walked into the store. Unbeknownst to Stacy, he was not there to make a purchase. This man was armed and had only one thing in mind, violence. That night, Stacy disappeared from the red mini barn. By the following day, her body was discovered on a desolate stretch of road outside Blackfoot. She had been killed, the brutality of the crime shocking even the most seasoned investigators in the area. For a town that prided itself on safety and neighborliness, this was unthinkable. Stacy's death shook Blackfoot to its core. Friends, family, and even strangers felt the sting of loss. But tragically, this was only the beginning. As investigators worked tirelessly to gather evidence and piece together what had happened, fear began to ripple through the town. Whoever had taken Stacy's life was still out there, and there was little to go on. Witnesses recalled seeing a strange vehicle around the area that night, but no one could offer a clear description. Residents started locking their doors, something they rarely did before, and avoided going out at night. It was as if Blackfoot's innocence had been stolen along with Stacy's life. 
Just weeks later, on March 16, 1987, in the neighboring town of Idaho Falls, another horrifying discovery was made. Nolan Haddon, a 20-year-old clerk at Buck's Gas and Grocery, was found barely clinging to life in the store's walk-in cooler. He had been shot multiple times. Nolan's injuries were severe, and despite doctor's best efforts, he died shortly afterward. Like Stacy, Nolan was simply doing his job, alone on the night shift, when he was attacked. His murder sent shockwaves through Idaho Falls, casting a dark shadow over what had previously felt like a safe and friendly town. By this point, law enforcement was starting to draw connections. The cases were eerily similar. Both Stacy and Nolan were young, working alone at night in convenience stores, shot with a similar weapon, and robbed of small amounts of cash. The randomness of the crimes made them even more chilling, and the sense of fear that had started in Blackfoot was now spreading throughout the region. People started questioning the safety of their night shifts, the routine trips to late night stores, and even who might be watching as they went about their business. Then, as if the killer was following a dark, twisted schedule, tragedy struck once more. On March 19th, just days after Nolan's murder, Susan Mikkelbacher, a special education teacher in Idaho Falls, vanished from a grocery store parking lot. She was a well-known and respected member of the community, beloved by her students and colleagues alike. Her disappearance struck fear into the hearts of everyone in Idaho Falls, who dreaded that this was somehow connected to the two recent murders. Susan's body was found two days later in a remote, isolated area just outside town. Although she did not fit the profile of the previous victims in terms of her occupation, the brutality of her murder and the fact that she was also shot confirmed to investigators that these attacks were not random acts of violence. This was a spree, and they feared it wouldn't end until they found the person responsible. The investigation had reached a boiling point, and authorities knew that time was running out. With evidence from the crime scenes and help from witnesses, police zeroed in on a man named Paul Ezra Rhodes. A man with a troubled past, Rhodes quickly became the prime suspect in these brutal attacks. The mounting evidence against him, including ballistic matches and witness accounts placing him near each scene, led to his arrest on March 25, 1987. The trial that followed was intense, with the townspeople eager to see justice for Stacy, Nolan, and Susan. Despite his claims of innocence, the evidence was overwhelming. Paul Ezra Rhodes was convicted for the murders of Stacy Baldwin and Susan Mickelbacher, both first degree and given life sentences for the murder of Nolan Haddon. For these quiet towns, the conviction was a bittersweet victory. Though justice had been served, the wounds left by these crimes would take years to heal. In the years that followed, Rhodes and his legal team filed numerous appeals, attempting to overturn his convictions. But each attempt failed, and in 2011, after decades on death row, Rhodes was executed, marking Idaho's first execution in 17 years. For the families of Stacy, Nolan, and Susan, this long-awaited resolution brought a sense of closure, though the loss they suffered would remain with them forever. The case of Stacy Baldwin and the series of murders that followed served as a grim reminder that even the quietest towns can be shattered by unimaginable darkness. To this day, the communities of Blackfoot and Idaho Falls remember the lives of those lost and the lasting impact these tragic events had on their towns. Their stories live on, a sobering reminder of vulnerability, resilience, and the long, arduous road to justice. On April 26, 2013, in the small town of Norton Shores, Michigan, a young mother named Jessica Hearinga was working the late shift at a local ExxonMobil gas station. 25-year-old Jessica was known for her friendly personality, her love for her young son, and her desire to create a better life for herself and her family. She often worked these late shifts alone, finishing up the day's work under the quiet, dim lights of the station just off the main road. It was a modest job, but Jessica was dedicated to it, always showing up and putting in her best effort to make ends meet. That evening, Jessica was scheduled to close up the station, something she had done countless times before. The night seemed like any other, but by the time the clock struck 11 p.m., everything changed. At 10.51 p.m., Jessica rang up her last transaction, 
a routine moment in what seemed to be an ordinary shift. However, just minutes later, a customer arriving at the station found it eerily empty. The gas station was silent, the lights were on, and everything appeared in place, except for Jessica. Inside, Jessica's belongings were scattered in a way that suggested she hadn't planned on leaving. Her purse, keys, identification, and even $420 in cash from the register were still in the store, untouched. Jessica's car was parked outside where she always left it, but Jessica herself was nowhere to be found. There were no immediate signs of a struggle, just a small spot of blood found near the station's back door. Authorities quickly arrived and began searching for Jessica, but without surveillance footage or solid leads, there was only one conclusion they could reach. Jessica had been taken. As the investigation into Jessica's disappearance began, a few key details started to emerge. Witnesses reported seeing a man interacting with Jessica earlier that evening. He was described as a Caucasian male, around six feet tall, with a medium to heavy build, wavy, sandy brown hair, and a distinctive red or orange sweatshirt. Eyewitnesses also noted that the man was driving a silver minivan, a detail that would prove to be critical in the case. With no security cameras at the gas station itself, detectives began piecing together footage from nearby businesses. One camera, located a mile away, captured a silver minivan driving past around the time Jessica disappeared. But this small clue didn't provide nearly enough information to identify a suspect. Jessica's family and friends were left devastated, grappling with the reality of her sudden disappearance and the painful mystery surrounding her fate. Weeks turned into months, and as the case grew colder, hope faded. But in May 2016, over three years after Jessica vanished, police in nearby Muskegon County made a startling arrest. Jeffrey Willis, a local factory worker, had been apprehended after a teenage girl reported a harrowing experience with him. She told police that Willis had attempted to lure her into his van and that, after accepting a ride, she barely escaped with her life. The connection was made almost immediately. Willis's vehicle was a silver minivan, just like the one seen near the gas station the night Jessica disappeared. As detectives began investigating Willis's life, they uncovered a trove of disturbing evidence. Searching his van, authorities found a .22 caliber pistol, its serial number filed off, along with a range of other items that hinted at something much darker. There were syringes, various binding materials, and video equipment. It became clear that Jeffrey Willis was not just a factory worker, he was someone with a dark and sinister side. Investigators soon linked Willis to another cold case involving Rebecca Bletch, a 36-year-old woman who had been found dead in 2014 while jogging along a rural road in Muskegon County. The ballistics from the bullets that killed Rebecca matched the gun in Willis's van. Willis was quickly charged with Rebecca's murder, and as the case against him mounted, detectives began to focus on his possible connection to Jessica Hearinga. The following months brought more revelations. Investigators learned that Willis often passed by the Exxon Mobil station where Jessica worked, and he was reportedly a frequent visitor. But perhaps the most damning testimony came from Willis's cousin, Kevin Bloom. Bloom initially denied knowing anything about Jessica's disappearance, but later gave a different account. In a statement to police, he described seeing Jessica's body and provided disturbing details about what he claimed had happened. Although Bloom's statements varied over time and were often inconsistent, his testimony added weight to the prosecution's case against Willis. In 2018, Jeffrey Willis went on trial for the murder of Jessica Hearinga. In the courtroom, the prosecution painted a chilling picture of a calculated predator who had spent years honing his tactics. The jury heard from witnesses, examined evidence, and considered the forensic findings that had been pieced together over five long years. Although Jessica's body was never recovered, the evidence surrounding her disappearance and the other crimes Willis had committed left little doubt in the jury's mind. After just 90 minutes of deliberation, they returned a guilty verdict. Willis was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, ensuring that he would never walk free again. Today, Jessica Hearinga's case remains a tragic reminder of how one quiet evening at a small town gas station can turn into a lifelong nightmare for a family and community. Jessica's family continues to grieve, haunted by unanswered questions and the pain of not knowing exactly what happened to their loved one. The community of Norton Shores rallied around Jessica's family, 
and the case spurred conversations around security for workers like Jessica who often find themselves alone and vulnerable during late shifts. Jessica's story serves as a somber example of the dangers that can lurk even in the most ordinary of places and a reminder to cherish every moment with those we love, for we never know what tomorrow may bring. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Thank you for listening.